Good morning. It's great to see you today. Welcome to the Avenue. We're going to have a great day today. David's speaking about heaven. It's going to be awesome. Let's stand together, say good morning to someone around you, and we'll sing together.
dances all around that the spirit of the Lord is would you bow your heads with me as we pray together this morning to receive our offering and God we thank you we thank you for your presence we thank you that you're here and that you've drawn us to yourself we thank you for uh, all the great and awesome things that, that you've done in our lives and, and what you still want to do. And God, for those of us who call the Avenue home, we take these next couple of moments and, and uh, we respond to your goodness and we respond to um, the ways that you've given to us by giving our tithes and our offerings. We're thankful and we're excited to see what you do uh, through the Avenue around the world. We pray specifically today for, for a team uh, from the avenue that's in Guatemala uh, and on mission there and serving there and helping meet needs there. We pray that the work done there is, is fruitful and uh, that, that you show yourself and we trust and know that you will. We thank you for the people of the avenue who, who are generous uh, in times like this uh, to make trips like the, the one in Guatemala to make that possible. Uh, and again, we thank you for letting us be a part of it. I pray this in your great name. Amen. I'm singing, I've been strong. I've been strong and I've been broken within a moment. I've been faithful and I've been reckless in every bend. I've held everything together and watched it shattered. I've stood tall and I have crumbled in the same breath. I have wrestled and I have trembled towards surrender. My heart had drift and drifted home again Plundered blessing till I've been desperate to find redemption Every time I turn around, Lord, you're still there Let's sing it, I was found
I can never add To be somebody you still want But somehow You love me as you find we get, no matter out of how far out of control uh, we seem to be at times, you, you're here for us. Your presence is here. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your love. Uh, we pray that you just open us up, that you can speak to us. We pray this in your awesome name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for singing with us. Go ahead and be seated. Avenue. We are in a series called Heaven, but before we get into that series, I, I do want us to remember that there's a team from the Avenue that is down in Guatemala City. 
They are doing an incredible work down there because of people like you and your generosity. They have gone down there. They've taken school supplies for about 100 of the children in the school that we partner with. And through Engadi Ministries, we are serving that community in a way that, that is an, an amazing, an amazing opportunity. We've been there several years now. And each summer we go down and we train the teachers. And the teachers can't wait for our teachers to go down there and be a part of it. If you've never gone, they're in the poorest zone in Guatemala City. It is an incredible place of ministry. And so we want to remember them. So be praying for them. They'll be back sometime this week, but they are down there for us and for Jesus this week. We are in a series called Heaven. I started it last week. For those of you that didn't attend or, or didn't hear it online, it's online. It'll be online for the rest of eternity. So go online and, and get that and get that first series because we talked a lot about this place called Heaven. Now, Heaven is a place that we all hope to go to. You know, there's nobody in here. How many of you want to go to hell? Nobody's going to raise their hand. We all hope to get to heaven, and we're going to spend an extraordinary large amount of time there. We're talking eternity. But it's amazing how little we actually study heaven or how little we talk about heaven. Because after you've met Jesus, the only way to get to heaven is to do what? Die. And so we don't want to talk about that. We don't want to talk about, you know, in heaven, in heaven, because we don't want to die. We want to live as long as we can because we don't understand the true scope of what heaven's going to be. And the information we've received is pretty faulty. I mean, honestly, I do not want to be wearing a diaper with little wings that are too small for my big body, sitting on a cloud playing a harp. That's not heaven. And I enjoyed the worship service. Man, it was a beautiful worship service. That last song is incredible, isn't it? You love me as you find me. I mean, that's incredible. I enjoy worship for about 30 minutes. After that, I'm ready to do something else. I can't imagine an eternity just singing. And some of you can't even listen to me for 20 minutes. So I know you're not going to be listening to sermons for eternity. That would just, that'd be the other place also. And so we want to see what heaven is actually about. And so the book of Revelation, we started it last week and we read the passage, gives us a picture of John. John is one of the original followers of Jesus. He is the one that he wrote the book of John, says, you know, uh, the one that Jesus loves, which is pretty arrogant, but right on. Uh, and then he wrote first, second, third John. And then he wrote a book called Revelation. And we have there a, a beautiful picture of what heaven is like in human words. And so he tries to describe it. And so I want you to see that. I'm going to want you to, if you have your Bible, turn to Revelation 21. If not, you can follow up here on the screen. It says, John writing, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. Now I want you to stop right there for a minute. This is not part of the sermon. This is extra. I want you to understand this is important to John. Because John has spent in his entire ministry, he's an old man now when he writes this, and he spent most of his ministry in a place called Ephesus. In Ephesus, he created a church there. He preached at that church. He had a family. He had all the people around him that he loved incredibly. And that's about the time that the church started going into a period of persecution. The other apostles were taken and they were killed in many different ways, many of them crucified. Peter, we know, was crucified upside down. And then they decided to kill John. So the Roman officials took John into Rome and out in the Colosseum, they were going to put him to death in front of all of the Roman crowd. And they decided to put him to death. Now, this is in extra biblical materials. Don't go looking in your Bible for it. You're not going to find it in the Bible. This is extra writings that are written at the same time. Anyway, they decide they're going to kill him. So they lift him up and they get this boiling pot of oil and they get it as hot as it can possibly be. And they've killed people by dropping them into boiling oil because, once again, they look for creative, horrible ways to kill you. So they dropped him into this boiling oil, and guess what? He didn't die. He dropped down into this oil, and he's like, can you turn it up a little? It's a little cool. I don't know he said that. I'm kidding. Anyway, he didn't die. So the Roman officials had to do something with him, and so they banished him to a little island called Patmos, which was across a strait from Ephesus. So every morning that John woke up alone and by himself, he looked out over that sea to the place he longed to be. He longed to be with his family, with his friends at his church in Ephesus serving the Lord, but he was exiled from that. So when John says there's no longer any sea, he's talking about there's no longer any separation from those you love. There's no longer any separation from family. You never have to say goodbye to anybody that's important to you again. He goes on and says, I saw the holy city, 
the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Now, this is a new kind of place. This is an incredible place. This is what heaven is going to be. Last week, I explained that when you die in this world, when you die, if you're a follower of Christ, you go to be in his presence, in the presence of God. Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so you go there. Jesus told a story of Lazarus and a rich man. And in this story, the rich man had no time for God, had no focus on God, didn't care about God, had everything in this world he wanted. The poor man was a, a, a hurting. The poor man leaned on God, but he had nothing else. When they died, Jesus says that Lazarus went to be in the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man went to a place of torment. In fact, it was so bad where the rich man was, he said, let Lazarus dip his finger in water and put it on my tongue to soothe my agony. And so we know when we die, we either go to a place of comfort or a place of torment. But at the end, John is writing not about that, but he's writing about this new heaven and new earth. He says, there's coming a time that we'll all be resurrected. At this point, Jesus is the only one that has been resurrected. Jesus is the only one with a resurrected body. The rest of us will be waiting for that resurrected body. At the end of times, when the rapture comes, at the end of times, when the new heaven and new earth comes, we're going to have a physical body and live in a physical place. Now, that is new to some of you because you always picture heaven as these spirits fleeing the material world and getting free from the earth. But the earth was intended to be an incredible place. The earth was intended to be a paradise, to be a place where we were in perfect relationship with each other and where we were in perfect relationship with God. That's what he intended. He intended it to be an exciting place, a place of adventure. That's why I don't believe we're going to have eternal worship services. I believe many of the things you enjoy here on the earth are going to be in the new earth, except we're going to live there without fear. We're going to live there without pain. We're going to live there. We're going to jump off a cliff into the ocean without fear. That's kind of fun, wouldn't it be? Have you ever jumped off a cliff? It's scary, isn't it? Even if it's only 10 feet, you look over the side and think, uh-uh. Now, I know somebody in here, there's no fear in you. For most of us, it's like, it's, you'll jump because of peer pressure, but you'll jump. And it's great when you do it, you know, not, not going through the air. The only thing great about it is when it's over, I understand. But we're going to live in a place that is full of adventure and full of joy, and our relationships are going to be made right. We're going to give up all of the disease and all of the death. We're going to give up the curse of sin. We're going to be in perfect relationship with each other. And then an exciting part in verse 3, it says we're going to be in perfect relationship with God. It's going to be incredible. Now, I want you to picture a place, first of all, with no more pain. I want to picture a place with no more sin, no more loneliness, no more depression, no more shame, no more guilt. He says, I'm making everything over. I'm starting everything new. Can you imagine starting over completely fresh, completely new, in perfect relationship with each other and in perfect relationship with God? I don't know about your relationship with God, but sometimes my relationship with God is rocky. And I'm just going to be real honest with you, and you're not going to hear this from a lot of preachers, but I'm not like a lot of preachers. There are times that I look at God, and I think to myself, what are you doing? Are you kidding me? I had an opportunity this week to look at God and go, you've got to be kidding me. I've questioned him. I've questioned, All right, do, you, do you have any idea what you're doing? There's times that I feel like God has actually let me down. That, that I've sought him and, and wanted something, and he's let me down. There's other times, to be completely honest, that I've even doubted his pre if he existed. I've looked, at, looked and gone, you know, if there's a God, he must not care. That's tough. And many of you have been in that position. Maybe some of you have never been in that position, but I have. God, you've got to be kidding me. Why are you letting this happen? I did a funeral this week for a two-year-old. How do I stand in front of a crowd of people and explain why God let a two-year-old drown? I can't explain that. 
That's under the category of God, I don't get it. But in verse 3, he says, God is going to live among us. That's the way it was intended in the book of Genesis. You see, he put two people together, and it says every afternoon he came down into the garden, and he walked with Adam and Eve, and they talked with him, and they were in a relationship with him, and they could ask him questions, and they could see his presence, and they had no doubt that God was God. What an incredible thing. What an incredible event. But we chose sin, and ever since we chose that sin, instead of running to God, we run away from him. Instead of going to God without doubt, we hide in fear. Ever since Genesis chapter 3, all we've had is anxiety, sin, depression. All we've had is disease and aging and death. We don't know what it's like to be in a relationship with God, truly. We don't know what it's like to be in a perfect relationship and understand. And listen to this. Do you realize in the new heaven and the new earth, we will be at perfect peace with everything that has gone on in our life? That's incredible. That gives hope. To know that everything you're experiencing now will one day be explained. Everything you've gone through, God will put his arms around you and you'll be able to ask him and he'll be able to tell you. That is incredible, the kind of hope that it's going to have when we get to be in perfect relationship with God. And not just in perfect relationship with God, in perfect relationship with each other. That's a perfect place. That nature of hope is, is exciting. No more doubt. No more fear. No more anxiety. No more aging, no more disease, no more death. That's a new kind of place. Living without shame, living without guilt, living in total freedom. Do you think we need that hope? I know I do. I want to live in that hope. Do you know who John was writing to in the book of Revelation? Now, we've messed it up. We look at the book of Revelation and we think it's some mysterious book about the future. We think it's talking about helicopters and bombs and atomic war and all of those crazy, crazy things. But let me tell you, John was writing to the people across the ocean that he loved, that he knew were about to face persecution like nothing no one, anyone had ever seen. He knew that the Romans were not going to stop by persecuting the apostles, but they were going to turn it on the church, and the church was going to become hunted and scattered, and they were going to get those people who said they were followers of God, and they were going to put them in the Colosseum and turn lions loose on them for sport. He knew that they were going to take these Christians, these followers, and they were going to put them in cages in their gardens and light them on fire with tar all over them just to light up their gardens and watch them die. He knew they were facing that persecution. In that persecution, he wanted them to understand that there's a new heaven and a new earth, and this is not the end of things, and this seems unfair, and you've given your life to God, and now you're going to lose your life, but there's more to come, and there's an exciting place that you're going to be, and so face this death and know that God is going to be with you. There was a pagan writer about this time that wrote, every time we put one of these Christians to death, it's like scattering seeds. For everyone we put to death, more scatter up and grow in their place. Why do you think that happened? Because when these Christians were going into the Colosseum to be fed to the lions, they were singing praises to God because of this hope. When they were lit on fire, they were singing until their death, and they were praising God because of this hope, and people saw that hope, and people need that hope. Because listen, we can't live in a world without it. You realize Your future determines how you live now. Your perception of your future determines how you live life at this moment. If you live this life thinking the future is hopeless and the future is without any grace or joy or happiness, you can't live your life now in any positive way. A great example I read about two men who were captured during the war. They were sent to a concentration camp, a labor camp, and it was going to be intensive. Most people died. One of the men found out that his wife and son had been killed in an attack. The other man found out that his wife and son had fled to America and was going to be safe. The first man, within six months, died in that camp. The other man survived for 10 years and came out of that camp to be rejoined with his family. They lived their life under the same circumstances, under the same conditions. Why? They live their life under the same conditions, same circumstances, one having hope, one not having hope. Here's an example for you. Let's say that I chose two of you today, and I had the ability, I said, listen, for the next year, I want you to come up here. We're going to put you in a small, dark room, 
And for 14 hours a day, I want you just to take a bolt and put it on a, a screw and put it in a box. Take a bolt, put it on a screw, put it in a box. It's going to be dark, no music, no internet, no phone. You sit in that room 14 hours just screwing nuts onto bolts, put them aside. I tell the first guy, at the end of the year, if you make it through the entire year, I'm going to give you $20,000. Sounds good, right? I tell the second guy, if you make it through the year, I'm going to give you $20 million. Sounds real good. So they go into this task. Within two months, at the most three months, what do you think the guy's going to do that's going to get $20,000? He's going to dread it. He's going to be miserable. He's going to show up. He's going to hate his life. And about two months in, he's going to say, it's not worth $20,000. I quit. I'm out. Forget it. How do you think the guy that's going to get $20 million is feeling? He's whistling while he's... <laughs> he's happy as he can be. He shows up every day excited. Why? Because the future. The future, what he's looking forward to, the hope that he has determines how he lives in the present. And listen, that is what happens with us. If you live with that hope, no matter what you're experiencing right now, no matter what pain is in your life, no matter what shame or guilt you have, when you know the future, everything is going to be made right. When you have that hope, you can live in the now. You can live in the now. That's why the church spread like wildfire, because they had this beautiful hope, and people saw the hope, and listen, everybody needs hope. Everybody wants more. Everybody needs more. So what do we do? Let me tell you, if this world is all there is, I understand anger, despair, and pain. If this is all there is, if this is it, now how do you get this hope? In the next verse, John writes in the book of Revelation, he says, he said to me, it's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give a drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. So how do we find this hope? We come to Jesus. Now, John is the same man that wrote the story about Jesus at a well when a woman came to him in the middle of the day. This woman had five husbands and was living with a man. This woman was an outcast because of her shame and guilt. She came to the well, and Jesus said, give me a drink. And she started having a theological discussion with him. And he said, if you'd have known who I was, you'd have asked me for a drink, and I'd have given you a drink. You'd have never thirsted again. I'd have given you eternal life. So here's a throwback to that. to say, if you want this hope, it is free to you. Just come to me. Jesus says, come to me, drink this water and live. Drink this water and have eternal life. Drink this water and have eternal hope. That way you can face whatever circumstance you find yourself in today. You can face any problem, anything, any wrong that's been done, and you know that one day it's all going to be reconciled. You can ask your questions about God. You can have your doubts. You can have your fears. But you hold on to the fact, and you know that one day that's going to be answered. That's hope. And when you have that hope, the very next thing we do is we share that hope. We share that hope with people around us. We give that hope. We look at our hopeless world and we share the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Acts 2, those early followers are all gathered in a room on the day of Pentecost. They're together in one place. And suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed like tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. On this day, the Holy Spirit came onto the church and the Holy Spirit has been there ever since. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we live differently. We live in a way that attracts people. We live in a way that we can share hope. We live in a way that others see that hope inside of us and they want what we want what we have. And I know they spoke in other tongues and they had this miraculous outpouring. But let me tell you, when you let the Holy Spirit work in your life and the church becomes what the church was meant to be, we will have an outpouring and people will flock to us because they will see this hope. When you live with this hope in your heart, when you live with this hope and people see this hope in you, when you're faced with the same exact circumstances that they're faced with, but they see you living in hope, they're going to come to you. When the church becomes what the church was meant to be. 
See, we don't have to wait for the kingdom of God. He brings it to us. Now, heaven is a different kind of place. But he wants heaven to come down on the earth as much as possible through his spirit. He comes into us and we become heaven on earth as much as possible. That means we can be in relationship with each other. And it's going to be harder here because we're all still sinners. So here our relationship is going to be filled with a lot more asking forgiveness and giving it. But we're to live in that way. To show hope later in Acts 2. It says because the Holy Spirit came on them and because they had this hope. And because they loved each other and were bringing the kingdom of God down, heaven on earth, because they were doing this, they began to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. It says all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as they had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's how we live out this hope. That's how we show people the hope and the kingdom of heaven is we bring the kingdom of heaven right here in this place. Through the Holy Spirit, we love each other in such a way that other people want what we want. We make the church community so attractive that a person says, I don't know if I believe in this Jesus, but I want my daughter to marry a Christian man. Because Christian men are better husbands and better fathers because of their hope. It's you being able to say, that I want to hire a Christian worker in my business because I know a Christian worker has integrity and a Christian worker is going to act differently and I'm not going to have to worry about that Christian worker stealing from me. Or it's you saying, I want to work for a Christian man because I know he's not going to take advantage of me. He's going to treat me fairly. The church should be such an attractive place that people are coming to know the Lord. That's how we share the gospel. That's how we share the hope of the world. We got to look different, act different, and live different than the world around us. And as long as we're caught up in all of this, as long as we're caught up and we live like they live without hope, without joy, without knowing there's more to come, we won't see people come to us. But you live it out. And all of a sudden your homes are... Not without problems, but there's hope in them. And your church is not without problems, but there's hope. And people will clamor to that. When things get rough in your life, when things go wrong, when you get persecuted, when you experience suffering, when you hold on to this hope and understand that this is not the end and this is not our home and we're only here for a short amount of time, we can live differently. When we know that our suffering is for a short amount of time and we'll spend eternity in perfection, we'll spend eternity in relationship, and we can ask God, what were you thinking? And he says, this is what I was thinking. For me, he's going to say, dummy. And I'm going, oh, that's good. That's good. Do you realize there's going to be a point in my life that I look at God and everything I've experienced, I will be able to look at him with tears and say, That's hope. That's hope. Do you have that hope today? Do you hang on that today? Is that in you? Because if you're trying to walk this life and this is all there is, I feel sorry for you. I want you to live in hope. And we have that by coming to Jesus, taking a sip of that living water, placing our faith in him, saying, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Come into my life. I want you to be the Lord of my life and I want to live with this hope. And then if that hope is in your heart, how can you not share it? How can you not give it away? How can you not invite others in? Listen, we live in a horrible place. It's full of sin. It's full of death. It's full of disease. It's full of people hurting one another. It's full of people being depressed and lonely. And we have the hope of the world. How do we not share it with the world? I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing. I said, we're going to sing, not leave, to go get your kids. We're going to give you your kids. I promise we do not want them. Well, I do not want them. But I want you to hear this song. I want you to sing this song. I want you to concentrate on this hope. And if you haven't experienced this hope yet, I want to invite you in. If you have experienced it, 
I beg you to share it. Would you bow? Father God, we thank you that you are the hope of this world, that we can have eternal joy and eternal peace. God, when we focus on you and whatever we experience in this world, we know we'll be made right in the next. Thank you, Father. Thank you for hope.
a great message today, a message of hope. No matter what we're up against, no matter what we face, uh, God is with us. We can know that and put our hope in that. It's, it's awesome. And we hope you have a great week this week. If you have any questions about the Avenue, how to be uh, involved in a life group, how to serve uh, in our church, in a ministry, or on a mission, join us in the hub and we'll answer all the questions you may have. It's great to see you today. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. If you have any questions or need prayer, send us a message at info at theavenuechurch.com. We are always here for you. Looking for ways to give from where you are? Text the amount to 84321. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us on social media to stay in the loop. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll see you next week.